Okay, I know you've come to hear our speaker, not me, so I'll be very brief. When I was training CSERT people a few years ago, I used to say that our job was to corrupt innocent sysadmins and network admins to make them think in different ways and do things that they'd never thought possible. First time I saw our keynote speaker, he was doing pretty much that to a Barbie doll. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Ken Munro from Pentest Partners has been up to um, in what I think of as the internet of things that should not be on the internet. Bear with me a moment while I plug some things in. This could take a moment or two. Looks like it's working. Crikey. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken, Ken Monroe, and um, my job, I'm a security researcher. I spend a lot of time working with a team of pen testers. There's uh, a lot of us there, but what we're really into is kind of going a bit further than many would um, and doing some really bizarre and what often come across as quite wasteful things. So we spent £5,000 on a smart fridge, destroyed it just so we could x ray the CPU. And in there, we managed to find a bunch of uh, via mappings, which meant we could enumerate the JTAG. And we found our way to root on a Samson smart fridge. That allowed us to extract the email credentials of the user who is using it by driving past it. We did lots of weird things. We spent a lot of time looking at smart devices, a lot of time reporting security vulnerabilities to smart device vendors. And I think what sets them apart is actually how they respond to responsible disclosure. So we've had everything from the most simple, seamless response, thanks guys, that's great, we'll get that fixed, it'll be done in 30 days, cool, through to legal threats and cease and desists, which never ends well, I assure you, because I don't know if any of you have come across this dry sand effect. It's amazing how the media take an interest when security researchers get um, threatened. So you probably saw the title of my talk, talking about backdoors in backdoors. And I'm sure some of you are expecting me to talk about an amazing backdoor in Meterpreter. Or some of you might have seen my earlier work in um, adult toys, maybe. I don't know. We won't talk about that. I'm going to be talking quite literally about vulnerabilities in backdoors. This is very much a literal discussion. And I'd like to bring along a product we've been looking at recently. This is undisclosed research. We've been looking at a rather fun fingerprint door lock. This is it. It makes a heck of a racket. The idea being is you put your finger on there and you can get in. Fantastic. It's got a pin as well. It pads the pins. Thought this is going to be a really good, interesting, secure door lock to play with. It's called the Ultralock. So we started having a play with it, looking at how the technology worked and realized the most ludicrous of vulnerabilities is it connects also. You can unlock it using a phone. You can tap your phone. It uses Bluetooth Low Energy, Blee, and it uses a static salt, which you can reverse. You need to know two things. You need to know the Bluetooth characteristic, which it broadcasts whenever you talk to it. The last thing you need to crack is a six-digit pin. So it brings the realm of a crack into the matter of a few minutes. Just by walking up to a door, you've unlocked it. This is crazy. And there'll be a few of these smart door locks in this talk. But that's when things got just a little bit silly, because at the bottom of it, and you're really going to struggle to see there, is a small hole with a key, but there's a bit of space around the lock. And we would gobsmack, when we realized we could get in a small shim from the underside of the lock and trigger the spring. So this is a really, really smart lock. Not a good start, right? I know, sometimes you find the most simple tricks work. You don't even need to use your lock picks in the way they're intended. 
So let's go back a little bit. Now, I'm sure some of you will have seen our early work in fun things. You might remember my Wi-Fi kettle from back in the day. I'd like a show of hands. Who remembers the Wi-Fi kettle? Wow, only a few of you. Crikey, we'll do this in detail then. Excellent. Most of you are now going, why the heck have you got a Wi-Fi kettle, Ken? Well, <laughs> the idea being is you place this in your kitchen as a smart base, and it means when you wake up in the morning, you roll over out of bed, you press a button on the smartphone app, and by the time you get to the kitchen, you've got a kettle full of boiling water, saving you maybe 30 seconds of your day. Wow, this is cool. Now, I saw this ages and ages ago. I think this is four and a half years I first found the Wi-Fi kettle. And I thought, surely, no, they've got the security of this right. Well, so I started reverse engineering it, which usually means getting a screwdriver out, because I want to look at the hardware. I got the base in pieces. I found the chipset. I found the manual for the chipset on the public internet, because you do. I then reverse engineered the mobile application. Android, it's easy. It's just a Java resource. It's human readable. I started looking at how it connects. So OK, port 23, Telnet. It's not a good start, but hey, you know, I've got to be on, the, on the, the right network to start with. I've got to compromise the home. So I'm on port Telnet. So I Telneted to my kettle, and it came up with a terminal, and it required a pin. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Brute force? It's going to take a while. So I started looking through the manual. I looked for the, just searched the manual for the word pin. And the pin was six zeros. And it was static, and it couldn't be changed. One, two, three, four, five, six. Brilliant. I then looked through the mobile application and looked to see how it configured itself as a wireless client on your network. Because in order to do that, it's going to need your pre-share key, right? Your wireless passcode. I then tried the same commands you used to set it up, AT plus key, and I could recover your Wi-Fi network key in plain text by connecting to your kettle. Even better, it responded well to de-authentication, so I could drive past your house, de auth your kettle, set up an evil twin, and recover your wireless network key. All because you wanted to boil hot water from your bedroom. Wise, hey? But did that really matter so much? Because you could only boil on your local network. You could only command the kettle on your same Wi-Fi hotspot. There was no API, so it didn't really matter. It was one at a time. I mean, there were some fun things you could do. So you could geolocate them. So you could go out and find all the kettles in the west of London. That was quite cool. So if you want to just search Wiggle, uh, the SSID you're looking for is iKettle. And you can go and find all the kettles in the world, loads of them. So you know where people's PSKs can be stolen from. Great. And you probably also remember my swearing doll. Another show of hand, please. Who's, who remembers my friend Kayla? Too many of you. Oh, we'll do her anyway. Come on. So this is my friend Kayla. She's an interactive talking kids doll. Brilliant fun. The idea is the child can talk to the doll, and the doll can decode the voice to text and then have a number of interactive responses with your child. Now, I saw her a few years ago on the shelf in the toy store. I thought, hmm, she looks interesting. It said, child safe on the box, internet friendly. And it also suggested she had some anti-profanity filters. Ah. So if the child swore at the dolly, it would tell them to go and speak to their parents. And the hacker in me is going, can I make this doll swear? She's too innocent, isn't she? But before we go there, I started looking at how she operated. So she connects to a smartphone, and the phone does all the heavy lifting. It does the voice-to-text conversion and contains all the data. The doll has a speaker, a microphone, and a Bluetooth connection to the phone. And I kid you not, she's effectively a Bluetooth headset. You can connect it to your cell phone and make telephone calls on the doll if you wish. <laughs> and I, as you probably know, in the UK, it's illegal to drive with your cell phone to your ear. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I did genuinely check with the police officer. <laughs> and he decided that as it was a Bluetooth headset, in theory, it was legal to drive with a doll to your ear. <laughs> Get some very bizarre looks. Anyway, back to the technology. How did we figure out how to make her do stuff? So we reverse engineered the mobile app. And I'm thinking, how does she know how, what a swear word is? 
In order to understand what the child says, she must have a database of swearing content. So we reverse engineered the app and inside found a SQL-like database full of 1,536 really good swear words. <laughs> so we deleted it. <laughs> and now she swears like a docker. <laughs> And I thought I would record it for you. Now, hopefully, this will work. Uh, let's give it a little go on the audio there. Hey, calm down, or I will kick the shit out of you. <laughs> She's so rude. Well, what are we going to do? Now, that was the fun bit. I was, uh, I was just doing that for my entertainment with some of my colleagues. But there is a serious side to this as well. When she connects to your phone over Bluetooth, she uses Bluetooth Classic. And unlike your hands-free car kit connection, there is no pin. You don't have to submit a pin to connect to the doll, which means that anyone in Bluetooth audio range can connect the speaker and the microphone of this dolly, which means someone across the street in the next house can speak to your child through the doll and can listen to you through the doll. And I find that really very creepy indeed. Now, we put the doll to bed a few years ago. I got bored of her. But then a consumer protection organization in Norway picked up on some of the work we'd done and realized, actually, there are huge privacy problems. And I'm going to leave Kayla for a bit. We'll come back to her a little bit later, because there has been some good news and some progress, which is great. Other crazy things we've been looking at. I thought, four years ago, five years ago, when I first got into Internet of Things security, I thought that market forces and pressure from consumer organizations and governments would improve matters. I thought that demand, forces, concerns about privacy would actually drive manufacturers to make things better. And unfortunately, over the last couple of years, I've been seeing things start to get worse. I've seen security flaws that affected point products like my doll and my kettle now start to become systemic. And it's no longer a hack of one thing in one house at a time. It's now a hack of all the things concurrently. And that's what the, I'm going to dwell on in most of my talk today. The kettle, as was, is now much more secure. The 3.0 version of the iKettle is actually really good and really well locked down. And the reason they did that is they brought in some, some expertise in-house. I know the guy in-house there. He's a really cool guy. And they also outsourced their back-end platform provision to a third party who actually really knows their stuff. However, we've been looking at lots of different outsourced IoT platforms and found a whole train wreck of vulnerabilities. And I'm going to start with one. And this is something that really bothers me, actually. This is a GPS tracking watch for kids. Now, for those parents of you out there, like me, have you ever had that thing when you go to the play park or somewhere and you turn your back for a moment and your child walks off and there's a huge panic, right? Well, it's happened to me. I'm, I'm clearly a bad parent, right? <laughs> but that moment of panic when my children have walked off, I'm now running around and I've had I've lost, I've sweated loads of five or 10 minutes wondering where one of my kids has gone. And the idea of these GPS tracking watches is that you can connect to the watch from a smartphone app and see where your child is. What a brilliant idea. Or for elderly or vulnerable relatives, you can also track them. So if people with maybe cognitive issues or impairments walk off, you can find them again easily. What a great idea. So we started looking at these and found some really, really worrying security concerns. There's a GPS tracking device in there and also a SIM. The SIM so you can do data communications back to the mobile app. What we discovered was there are a series of insecure direct object references within that, which meant that user A could see the data for user B, which meant we could track something like 20,000 children in real time. We could also rewrite their positions using the API so we could make children either appear to be where they're supposed to be when they've been abducted, or make them appear to have driven off down the uh, motorway. Pretty horrible, right? This is a device that's supposed to make our children safer and give our parents confidence, but actually it makes our children more vulnerable. And the really creepy bit, it has a mobile SIM in, so it has GSM functionality. The idea is if the child presses an emergency button, it sets up a call to their parent and only their parent. We discovered flaws in the API, that allowed anyone to silently call the watch and listen to the child. So your children could be snooped on. We thought, this is bad. That's not good. And we started digging deeper and deeper into the GPS trackers. We found GPS trackers on elderly for tracking 
infirm people living alone. We found trackers on cars. So far, we've tracked nearly 32 million different devices on over 1,000 different device types, every one of which could be connected to remotely and listened to or the position rewritten. Pretty horrible, isn't it? In this particular case, this was um, a campaign that was taken up by the Icelandic data protection regulator. And they banned a watch using a rather cool EU RAPEX alert, which I've never seen before, which gets a, an instant alert across the whole of Europe to all data protection agencies. We went a little bit deeper. We realized that actually the RAPEX alert that affected one brand of watch actually affected 367 different device types from an ODM called ThinkRace. These are what I mean by systemic security flaws. It doesn't affect one thing. It affects everything and multiple brands. And some of you might have seen that I spoiled your Christmas Eve. We did a piece of recording with the BBC, and we found a hot tub, a smart hot tub that you can control from your smartphone remotely with no account authorization at all. All you needed was the ID of the tub. There was no user account, no authentication. You just sent a request with the tub ID, which was sequential, so it didn't take very much to do. And you could compromise people's hot tubs. Now, this was silly. The only things you could do were turn it on and off. So if you really wanted to annoy people, you could freeze out their hot tub. Or you could turn on the jets, which sprayed you with water. Not so serious. But it did matter. Because in just the same way as systemic flaws we saw earlier, we found lots and lots of other devices connected to the same back-end platform with no sufficient authentication or device authorization. And they included trucks, cars, and we even found two different types of smart medical devices connected to the very same back end. So a hot tub led us into a smart heart assist valve. Getting creepier by the moment, this, isn't it? It's not a good place to go. I'm sure you've all remember Mirai. Do you remember October 2016 when I lost Twitter for two hours? I didn't know what to do. Mirai, you probably remember it as an IoT botnet that affected printers, cameras, VoIP phones, lots of things. It took social networks down by DDoSing a, a DNS provider. It wasn't. Mirai version one was not an IoT botnet. It was something quite interesting. It was a digital video recorder botnet, not even CCTV. So you use a DVR to record the footage from your CCTV cameras. That was one we found another vulnerability in. And what had gone wrong is during the process of reverse engineering the firmware, the, the code of Mirai, is 63 sets of default credentials were found. And some really cool people doing a lot of great work tried to match up those default credential sets with known default creds. And most of them, they got right. But a number of them went wrong. And a few examples, so ZL ZLXX dot, no one could find that one. Turned out it was a Cubist DVR. We managed to make that match. You see there is a printer and a VoIP phone. So what had gone wrong is people were trying to match the credential with known default credentials. Instead of going a little bit deeper and going, actually, there's something common to all of these. So we bought 63 different digital video recorders and successfully proved that Mirai version 1 was a DVR botnet and nothing else. That's not to say version two, three, and onwards do attack other devices, but Mirai version one was just about these. And what that research then uncovered was that Mirai was a single point fail. And it was a single fail in a vendor called Zhong Mai. This was work we did in 2016. It all pointed back to one make pack, so it's a bit like an SDK that allowed the device manufacturers to customize the branding of the DVR firmware. So when you look at it, all the, fir all the firmware and UIs look very similar, but they've got different brands. And it was this make pack that allowed you to recustomize so that XYZ brand DVR looks a little bit different for another one. And we also found a bunch of other vulnerabilities. Several code execution flaws, remote code execution that were never used by Mirai because they hadn't been found. And what I found frustrating about Mirai was because it was classified as an IoT botnet, we missed the opportunities to see the systemic issue, which was one mistake by one vendor. And that, I think, was a real missed opportunity. Systemic vulnerabilities. Now I want to have some fun. Another crazy systemic vulnerability. This is the tap lock. Anyone seen the tap lock? Know what it is? 
So now the fingerprint padlock. And I love fingerprint padlocks because I'm hopeless with my keys. I'm forever putting my keys down and forgetting them. But I don't forget my fingers very often, which is a good place to be. So we started looking at the tap lock as an interesting device. It was um, funded on Shark Tank, so the equivalent of Dragon's Den in the USA. And a uh, YouTuber noticed that if he stuck a GoPro mount or a very sticky pad to the back of the lock, he could unscrew it and got a load of coverage about why people shouldn't buy this, this padlock. So we thought, interesting, let's see what else we can find. First of all, we discovered that the, the padlock he'd had was actually you know, had a, a design flaw in the one he had, and none of the others, for love and the money, could we get the backs off. But we started going further. And we started looking at the security of it. It's really secure. It's got 128-bit encryption. Great. Used by the military. Must be great, right? Yeah. Let's have a little look. So we started taking it apart. We started looking at how you unlock it. You have three options. Fingerprint, you can tap it, or you can also bizarrely send Morse code to it. When was the last time we saw Morse code on anything? But we wanted to look at the Bluetooth connection. So we started connecting to it, saw these keys. What are those keys all about? Started going a little bit further. I think, what's going on here? There's some interesting characteristics going on. What more do we need to do? And we started reverse engineering the mobile app to see how these keys were created that it unlocks over Bluetooth and realized it was getting the seeds from the MAC address, the Bluetooth MAC address, the one characteristic it broadcasts publicly that anyone can connect to. What it turned out to be doing was chopping the MAC address in half, uppercasing one, lowercasing the other, and turning it into the key, which means that anyone could walk past the padlock and unlock it. Oh, and for a laugh, here we go. We managed to unlock it in just under two seconds. There it goes, it's popped and it's now out. Crazy. We're still thinking this is a point issue. So we disclosed it to the manufacturer, we told them about this issue and they said, yeah, it's all right, we know about that. <laughs> well, that's an unusual response to disclosure. <laughs> wow, okay, so you know about this and you're not doing anything. Okay, fine. Well, then some weird stuff happened. We discovered that the API that the mobile app connects to also leaks the GPS position of all of the locks. And you can unlock the locks over the API. <laughs> Could it get any less secure? I don't know. So I sent them an email in the end, just that's the, a copy of the email I said. I said, guys, this is crazy. This is a security product. And it's trivial to compromise and you've acknowledged that you know it's secure, insecure, sorry. So you need to take your API down because people can still unlock it locally and safely using the fingerprint mechanism, but you can't disclose people's GPS coordinates of their houses, of their accounts. And do you know what? They did. So I think they rescued victory from the jaws of defeat there. They took their API down, which I thought was really, really responsible. Um, and you can't buy them anymore. <laughs> They took them off the internet. This one I had to import from uh, Germany, I think, in the end. They've been taken off. They're just about to relaunch, so I understand, and they were talking about maybe sending one for us to have a little play with. Get in. <laughs> More issues with systemic security flaws. Some work we did a little while back, some work we had a lot of fun doing, was starting to look at car alarm security and starting to see how people were addressing the problem with key relay. I'm sure you're all familiar with key relay. When you have a keyless entry key for your car, you get close, you can open it. And criminals turn up with a black box because hacking's being productized and can unlock and drive away your vehicle. So as a result of that, a lot of people are now investing in third-party car alarms. So additional layers of security, additional immobilizers, additional functionality to further secure their car. Great, that's a good idea. So we started looking at these in a little bit more detail. And what really drew my attention was the word unhackable. Now, if you currently follow me on Twitter, you'll know that if you use the word unhackable in your marketing, I'm going to own you. It's going to happen. Whether it's me, part of my team, or whether it's a group of people we put together, never, ever use the word unhackable. And what annoyed me is they'd equated the idea of being unhackable with the fact they'd never registered a breach. 
That doesn't mean you're unhackable, it just means you haven't been hacked yet. And there's lots of mumbo jumbo, stuff that makes no sense. So we started looking at it. So we started looking at the mobile apps, downloaded it, and we realized that you can do very similar things with your car alarm as you can do with your smart vehicle app. So if any of you had a, have a high-end vehicle, you might have an app so you can find it when you've lost it in the car park and can't remember where it is. So you can do very similar things. That was interesting. I thought I'd have some fun with this. So I'd like to introduce my colleague, um, Vangelis, TV Stickass. He's really worth following on Twitter. He does lots of fun stuff. And uh, we filmed this, and the TV guys said, look, OK, bring him in on, um, on Skype, but could you have him put a black hoodie and some reflective sunglasses on, please? <laughs> but it's not normally him, but I had, to, I had to put this up. And we started looking. We started creating a couple of accounts, and we realized, just like with the kids' watches, there were insecure direct object references, so incorrect authorization was being applied to user accounts, which means you could mess around with bits and pieces and start doing weird things. The idol we found in this case was on the password reset email. So every other action that um, you did with your app was fine. It was authorized and checked that you were you. However, when you changed the password reset email address, it didn't correctly authorize that request, which meant we could change it to our email address, trigger a password reset, receive the password reset email, change the password, lock the user out, and take over their car alarm account. So we're now in an interesting place, aren't we? So the problem we've now got is, because there was hardware involved, we couldn't just hack someone else's car. So we had to go and fit vehicle alarms, expensive vehicle alarms, to our own vehicles. And I had to have a conversation with one of my colleagues where I said, I'd like you to fit a vulnerable car alarm to your car that makes it easier to steal. He went, oh, OK, that's fine, Ken. That's not an issue. So what we've discovered is once we've got compromise, on the left-hand side there, first thing we could do is we could query the API, and we could query the type of vehicle. So if you want all the Lamborghinis, you can query them using the API. So you've got a nice little attack list for your uh, criminal. Next thing we could do is we could get GPS coordinates in real time of all the vehicles. So we could track everybody. So we knew where the cars were to steal. But privacy-wise, also quite worrying too, because we know where you are. We could then find a vehicle, trigger the immobilizer remotely, set off the panic alarm so the alarm starts going. The owner stops. The vehicle stops. It cannot be restarted. We can then pop the doors and go and take the keys and take the car away. And in some cases, we can even do it without the keys. So that is car alarm that makes your car easier to steal. Like the irony of that one? Hmm. Just to recap, that affected about 2 million vehicles. The brand was Pandora. We could locate you in real time. We could choose the type of car we want and unlock and immobilize and de-immobilize the car to order. But then some weird stuff happened. We read the manual. And bottom right there, do you see it says microphone? Why is there a microphone in a car alarm? It's an unusual thing, right? Apparently, it turns out, very much like the e-call functionality you have with modern vehicles, if there's a high G impact, it can automatically dial the emergency services for you. Great. But of course, in order to interact and speak to the emergency services, you need a microphone. Great. We discovered using the API, and those of you who still remember your DTMF, remember that? We could enable the microphone remotely and listen to two million people's cars. How often do you have a conversation in your car with your partner or someone else that you really didn't want anyone else to hear? It's all right, your car alarm snoops on you. Brilliant. We went further. Anyone familiar with Viper? Huge brand in the US, known as Clifford in the UK. One of the largest and most respective alarm brands out there. Blown away by the very same vulnerability. Wow. The car alarms that are making your cars easier to steal. Now, we always go through responsible disclosure with any vendor. And I have to say, we thought that Viper, being a US organization versus Pandora, who are a Russian business, we thought Viper would be first. Now, we tried usual methods, emails to contact us, phone calls. You should get call centers that don't have a clue what you're talking about. I'd like to report a security flaw in a car alarm. Sorry, sir, that's not on my list of questions I can answer. But in the end, I found the head of smart connectivity on LinkedIn, dropped him a line, he came back, really well received, and they fixed it in three days. So you can fix stuff fast if you're motivated. And Pandora, the Russians, no response. I got hold of the UK importer, they were a bit grumpy with me, didn't really know what a security vulnerability was. 
but blow me, they fixed it faster. They fixed the bug in two days across two million installations. That was cool. So you can get there if you try hard. Fun, hey? This is new stuff. I haven't talked about this publicly so much. We could also kill the engine in some circumstances to order. So we could pick on one of three million vehicles and kill the engine, bringing the car to a halt. Imagine you're driving home by yourself at night, remote area of the country. I can track you. I know where you are. Kill your engine. Great. Pull you, to a, pull, pull you over to a halt and I can pop your door locks. That's worrying, isn't it? There's also direct connectivity between many of these alarms and the CAN, the vehicle network, the CAN bus. That's to allow faster configuration so the alarm can recognize the CAN messages of the vehicle brand and automatically recognize the car type. We've also noticed some functionality that allows you to directly inject from the alarm as well. So we showed some work where we could take control from the car alarm API and directly affect this CAN bus stability. So we could DOS the car and bring it to a halt in some cases. There's also functionality in some, because the alarms allow remote start, which requires a brake pedal press in some vehicles, we found the ability to actuate the brakes and also tamper with cruise control. Not so good, is it? And something we're working on right now, that's my car parked at Terminal 5 a little while back. It's there again today. We've been looking at vehicle trackers. And we've discovered that the trackers that are there to reduce your insurance premiums, because if your car's stolen, the cops can find it again, we found API flaws in there that allow us to rewrite the position of your vehicle. So if it's pinched, the criminal can make it look like it's still there. Or you can send the cops off on a wild goose chase for a ghost vehicle. That's worrying, isn't it? Security that makes you less secure. We've also been looking at aftermarket dongles. I don't know if anyone here is interested in the security of CAN bus. Maybe you've connected uh, a Bluetooth module to your onboard diagnostics port. You can see lots of cool stuff. You can see much more information about your vehicle. There's a really interesting one going on with Tesla at the moment. Tesla's onboard diagnostics port is not really connected. It's only really got plus 12 volts and ground and nothing else. So as a result of which, people who want to know more about their vehicles uh, will typically go behind the big display, the CID, and pull out the X427 cable and plug straight in there. Direct powertrain CAN bus access from a device that has a Bluetooth pin of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you can geolocate and go there and DOS people's vehicles who've got aftermarket dongles on their onboard diagnostics. We managed to bring our Tesla to a halt, knocked out the entire powertrain, and amazingly, turned it off, turned it on again, back to life it came. Though I know one brand that if you did that to that would kill every ECU on the vehicle. Let's go and have some more fun, shall we? The word unhackable always gets my interest, and I'd like to go into a bit more detail about some work we did last year that some of you, I hope, will have seen. And I'd like to introduce you to the BitFi. Show of hands. Anyone know what BitFi is? Really? Wow, you're going to love this then. This is the BitFi. It is a cryptocurrency wallet that is designed for you to store your cryptocurrency passphrases and seeds on the wallet securely. As well, you know, the most common route to getting um, crypto um, currency stolen is people disclosing or using simple pins. And this is the BitFi, hardware cryptocurrency. Well, I'm going to read out the quote on it. It says, the world's first unhackable storage for cryptocurrency and digital assets. Quote, John McAfee, who's a really interesting character. If you haven't read up on John, he's a very, very interesting um, individual. And uh, you probably want to Google John McAfee and bath salts. That's a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to tell you a story that is probably one of the funniest things I think we've ever done. The idea being, this is the BitFi. You store your cryptocurrency seeds on there. It's the concept of a brain wallet. So the idea being is that um, the keys are never stored anywhere except up here. So we started looking at this. And the reason we were interested is that, first of all, they claimed they were unhackable. Bad place to start. But they put their money where their mouth is. They said, right, we're going to put up 100,000 bucks for anyone who successfully recovers passphrase and salts from one of these. We're like, ooh, I like that kind of job. That's right up our street because we do embedded systems. Okay, so 
we started doing some work. We started looking into it. This bounty is in, not intended to help us because our security is absolute. Ooh, this is getting more interesting by the moment, isn't it? So we started going a bit further. We realized they'd made a fatal mistake. They claimed the fact that they were unhackable was the same as one very specific attack. They said, we're not vulnerable to X, but by that, we're therefore not unhackable. That's a big mistake to make. So we got hold of one. They're 120 bucks and started looking at the back. And the bit that made me chuckle is it has an entropy source for seeding your crypto, which is a six-sided die. Wow, OK, going to have to roll that enough. And also a firmware encrypted CPU. Now, I've been in embedded for 23 years, and I don't know what a firmware encrypted CPU is. I've never seen one. So we put a team together, and that is my colleague, Cyber Gibbons. Well worth the follow, by the way. Um, he's recently updated his avatar. He's much cuddlier now. <laughs> Definitely worth a follow. If you want to know about embedded system security, he is fascinating. We put together a team, six of us at PTP, and about another 15 researchers from around the world with security and expertise in, in wallet security. And this is where things started happening. We asked John McAfee directly on Twitter, openly on Twitter, about the claim of unhackability. The fact he stated there was no memory to hack. All the money is stored in a memorable phrase of choice in your head. And we're going, well, if there's no memory to hack, what's in here? OK, what's the point of this if it's all in your head? We then went further, asked him about the lack of memory to hack. He said, there is no RAM on the BitFi. There is no RAM. OK, that's interesting. He went even further. He said, it cannot be hacked. There is no software on the device and no memory. How does it work? <laughs> OK, a lot of bath salts going on here. So we opened it up. And I don't know about you, but I recognize that as 8 gigabyte DDR RAM. Memory. OK, let's go a little bit further. When I say there's no memory, <laughs> what I meant is there's nothing about seeds and keys, replied John. OK, that's fine. We're thinking this must be quite an interesting crypto wallet. Only $120, computing device, much more costly to manufacture than ordinary hardware. Wallet. Wow. So we've got one, started looking at it. And as soon as we got the back off, realized it's a MediaTek MT6580. It's a cheap Far Eastern phone. Cheap Android phone. Now, I don't know if any of you see it. It's quite obviously a very small phone. MediaTek MT6580. About $20 in bulk, charging us 120 bucks. So we pointed this out to John. John, it's a phone. It's absolutely not a cell phone or anything resembling a cell phone because all cell phones are hackable. OK. So I don't know about you, that looks a bit phony to me. <laughs> and that looks like it might be a bit of a phone. <laughs> um, and on their own website, the image that describes the BitFi is called smartphone. <laughs> and in their manual, they refer to it as a phone. OK. Bitfi then disowned John McAfee. <laughs> this is all getting a bit mad. I think, great, this is fun. We've got someone on the back foot. Let's have some more fun. So having disowned them, let's go and look at some of the fun stuff we found. Let's do the tech stuff. What did we actually get to? This is the product of about four weeks' work by 15 people uh, in different areas of the world. Um, I want to show you the fun stuff we got to. Very quickly, we realized MediaTek 6580, it uses a um, Screen multiplexer, so your uh, inputs, when you put your character strokes on the touch screen, it sends them to the CPU over I2C, unencrypted. So if you want to do this a really easy hack, you could just tap the I2C interface and sniff the keystrokes as they're entered. And if you want to do something fun like a supply chain attack, you just reduce the size of the battery, put in some maybe an extra GSM module that ported those out elsewhere. So that was the easy one. But then we realized, being a 6580, it's not the best known phone for its security, because it's got an unlocked bootloader, which you can't lock, which isn't great. So you've got access to file system. Bang, we're in a good place now. Good. That's not the best thing to do. Let's go a bit further. So then things started hotting up a bit with um, John McAfee and Bitfight at this point. And they decided, right, they had a $100,000 bounty. But now yeah, we've really started needling a bit. And they upped the bounty to 
quarter of a million dollars, going, you cannot hack this device. So for a bit of fun along the way, we, just to really annoy them, ran Doom on it. <laughs> so we've now rooted the BitFi. So we're in a good place now, aren't we? So before, I want to show you something. I'm going to stop this and go back to the beginning because the attack we found was actually over USB. I'll come back to it a little bit later. But we didn't want to put um, BitFi onto the center of what we were doing. So you see those wires hooked up to um, an SDI, SDM reader? They don't do anything. They're just tacked on with sticky tape. <laughs> this was just to make sure BitFi weren't following what we were doing at the time. So a little bit further. We've rooted it. Now, of course, to root it, you're going to need to reboot it. So you're potentially going to be wiping memory at that point. But the next place we wanted to go was to think about the device over Wi-Fi. So it's got a Wi-Fi module that talks to your home access point. Let's see what we can do over Wi-Fi. They claimed very clearly that you could not man in the middle any transaction over Wi-Fi because it was signed, blah, blah, blah. So we discovered it was trivial to man in the middle and then modify transactions. So you sent money other places. So another claim that was utterly discredited by them. However, the terms of the bounty were extracting passphrase and seed from a device that had been shipped to us by them. So it's going to be in flight probably for three or four or five days, by which time anything in memory is likely to have degraded. So what we needed to do was a successful cold boot attack in order to boot it and recover. So what we have here, I've recorded it on video, and I'm going to go right to the end, don't worry about yakety yak, right to the very end, after about three to four work, four hours, well, month, weeks of work, sorry, we successfully recovered the passphrase and salt from the BitFi through cold boot, satisfying the bug bounty. Wow. This is good. I don't know about you, I'm thinking about what I'm going to spend this money on. This is going to be a good time. But instead of acknowledging this, paying out, they then threatened us. It's like, wow, this is a really unusual response. I mean, we've had the occasional cease and desist from companies that didn't understand, but never overt physical threats. So things then started getting even weirder. John Macri took even more bath salts, couldn't type anymore. We don't know what gassing a ramen is. Um, I can only imagine it's also correct. But no one stole my coins. It's all rubbish. So we started needling them a bit further. And John Macri finally read, relented and said, OK, come to my ranch in the southern US, and you can demonstrate this to us. And we're like, I'm not sure about that, John. You're quite a character. You've been. You know, there's, there's reports of you having fired guns randomly while off your head on bath salts. Um, so we, th we thought about this, thought, you know, well, maybe we could. Um, but then the next thing we did was tweeted this. <laughs> We're like, this is John McAfee's personal protection squad. We're like, OK, um, I'm now feeling really nervous about flying to the USA. <laughs> so we offered him to come to the UK, but he, he turned us down. Um, so it, did we get the money? Did we hell? And to be honest with you, it was never about the money. If the money did turn up, we'd already agreed as a group to give it all to charity anyway, but we didn't think it was going to happen. It wasn't going to come. Did we get the money? Did we heck? No money turned up. But what we did get was a Pony Award at last year's Black Hat for the lamest vendor response, which I am super proud of. Um, now, Bitfi have changed their Twitter handle. It's now, it used to be Bitfi6, it's now the Bitfi. If you want to have fun, do follow them because they went really quiet for about six months as they went back and re-architected and went back to basics. And they just got back on the bath salts and are now starting to get aggressive on Twitter again. This is great. So we and many other people who have been involved in this project are starting to needle them again because they're making outrageous claims again and again and again. I don't know why they feel the need to do this. It's crazy. It's just asking for trouble. And there's a little bit of me going, well, hang on, it's only, what, about a month and a half until Black Hat. Maybe they want another pony this year. Get in. So some advice for any sort of hardware project you might consider. One of the most fundamental flaws IoT developers make is they don't get their base hardware right. The one thing you can't fix in the field is choosing the wrong chipset. If it doesn't have a trusted execution environment, it doesn't have a good entropy source, it doesn't have any sort of um, storage, or there's a known CRP bypass, you're screwed. 
you're going to have to do a product recall. If you can't update over the air, you're stuffed. You're going to have to do a product recall or just hold on and pray. If you're going to get firmware developed, get it developed by people who have a clue and software for your mobile app. Make sure that all those calls are correctly authorized. Make sure that the organization that's doing it for you knows what OWASP is, let alone follows a secure development lifecycle. Wow, crazy, right? Get advice really, really early on. And please, whatever you do, don't claim a product is unhackable as part of your marketing campaign, because it's going to end badly, I promise you. I will be there waiting. But also what makes me sad is that things don't really change. And that's what's frustrated me over the last few years. And this is a piece of work we did in 2014, five years ago. And you might remember Tesco did a really cool tablet. It was a very cheap Android tablet called the Huddle. It was based on the Rock Chip, chip, Rock chip chipset. And they sold it for uh, equivalent of about 60 pounds if you used their loyalty vouchers from the Tesco club card scheme. Great idea. I thought it was a really, really nice product, actually. Got a lot of tablets into people, into kids. Great, really good. However, they built it on the Rock Chip firmware, on the Rock Chip CPU, sorry, which had a known bypass in their, um, their flash mode. Now, in most flash modes for um, any CPU, you'd expect to have write access because you're trying to reflash it with new firmware, potentially. But the flaw that Rockchip had is in that flash mode, you also had read access. So you could read arbitrary memory. And we showed through a really little simple trick. All you had to do is hold down volume down and put a pin into the reset port, plug in USB, and you could read arbitrary data from memory. Now, we reported that to Tesco, and they went, thanks, that's really cool. Um, we've got the Huddle 2 about to ship, and we're going to pull the Huddle 1 straight away. Is that OK? Wow, what a cool vendor. Yeah, and we'll put out some new firmware for the existing users. Cool. Five years ago. Five years ago this happened. So we're thinking, surely no vendors who truly understand security would ever consider building a product on a CPU with a known flash mode floor. So I'd like you to introduce you to the VTech Initab. VTech, that vendor who's had an amazing time of doing security really, really badly. It's got breached. And this is one I bought quite recently, actually. So here we are five years down the line, and we're still finding a vendor producing product Smart devices for kids based upon a chipset with a vulnerable flash mode. But what made me laugh the most is when I took the back off, I found that the OS is on a removable micro SD card that they super glued in. <laughs> it took moments with the craft knife to remove it and get access to all the data. And even worse, everything was running as root. Five years down the line from the original vulnerability, things aren't improving. I think that is really, really poor. So I'd like to wrap this up now by looking at, hopefully, some of the good news that faces us. A little bit of good news. In the EU, we have ANISA. I was at a briefing with ANISA at RSA in January, February this year. And there's been lots of great documentation put out. I think we were quoted in some of these um, good practice guides. And there is a move towards the certification framework, and the EU Cybersecurity Act is a really good step forward. But at the moment, as I understand it, please call me out if you think I'm wrong, it applies to critical national infrastructure. It's great, but it doesn't apply to IoT yet. And the last I heard was that regulation is perhaps not until 2023. Another four years of this current chaos of poor IoT product security. In the UK, we have the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, who have actually done some really cool stuff. And I support this. Uh, they started off by issuing some good practice guidance, so 13 fundamental principles towards basic security. And just last month, they've gone out for consultation on regulation on the top three of those. Now, it might not sound like very much, but you know what? It's a start. And not having things like shared common default passwords, so backdoor accounts or everything, that we find everywhere. And we're hoping that we'll see some regulation in the UK next year. And I think that's a really, really big step forward. Because I think what we've shown is market forces 
and not driving behavior of manufacturers yet. However, the one I'm most impressed with is California Senate Bill, Senate Bill 327. It's actually worth a read. It's a good document. And a bit I'm so proud of is that one of the senators who proposed this bill quoted our work on my friend Kayla as one of the reasons behind getting this going. And I think that's really cool. It becomes law on the 1st of January 2020 and it makes reasonable security features mandatory. Now, my only concern about that is what is reasonable security feature? But in fairness, NIST in the USA are working right now on what reasonable actually is. Although I have to say, I think there'll be quite a bit of case law required and test cases to define what the level of security that is appropriate for consumer devices. At the moment, there is some debate about whether this applies to a car. Is a car a smart device? I'd argue yes. It has many of the attributes that my friend Kayla does. Snoop on you, knows where you are, and other fun things. So that's really good progress. I think that's definitely going in the right direction. There have been some legal cases as well. Now, my friend Kayla was banned very quickly after we published our research. A, a German lawyer called Stefan Hessel noticed that the connection to my friend Kayla meant that other people could be overheard on the microphone. And that violates a German telecommunications privacy law from 1947. He pointed this out to the telecommunications regulator. And the next day, they put out an alert saying Kayla is now illegal to own in Germany, which made it really awkward because I was doing a talk in Munich. <laughs> But that's good. So we're also starting to see her banned by active data protection regulators. So she's been banned in most of the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands. You can hardly buy her in the UK anymore. And that's great. So we're seeing lots of different laws used to effectively ban smart product that isn't secure. And that's good. We have started to see some class actions in the USA which I think is fantastic. We've started to see some class actions brought against some manufacturers who were exceeding the terms of their own terms of conditions, which is great. Fantastic to see people using laws. Now, the only sad bit is that um, the two that have settled that I'm aware of right now are both smart adult sex toys <laughs> that were collecting too much data about how you were using the product and where you were using it. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but I'd be really uncomfortable if you found someone was tracking your thing. <laughs> yeah, we won't go into that anymore, shall we? I did say it was about back doors, but I didn't mean those back doors. <laughs> anyway. That brings me to a close. I'd like to thank you. That is my Twitter. If you want to follow myself or Cyber Gibbons, really worth it. And lots and lots of advice, tips and tricks on embedded system security, the state of regulation so far. And there's also a hit blog full of lots of interesting things that we're doing at the moment. Uh, we've got some wonderful disclosures coming up right now, including another company that claimed they were unhackable on Friday. And I cannot wait to disclose that, but I've got to do the right thing and wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Are you okay taking yeah, questions? Yeah, I can take questions. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I think there are microphones in the aisles somewhere, I hope. Can anybody see a microphone? Yes, there are microphones. Um, oh, right, down there. Any further back or the... Okay. So if you have a question, come to the microphone and fire away. Come on, it's early in the conference. You can't claim to be tired. Oh, we have someone in there. Heading this way. Yep. Uh, hello, Ken. Thanks for your talk. Uh, so, I mean, you point out the regulation coming through and everything, but there's a huge tail of devices out there right now. And it's, so, how do you how do you think we address the issue that it's time to market? It's a critical thing, and the large, huge number of devices which are already out there. Yeah, so that's a huge problem, particularly in automotive, because most of the auto OEMs have actually really got on top of security. They've got great security teams who are doing the right thing. But the problem they have is this lag. So from, you know, from a clean sheet to delivery of a new vehicle is going to be three years. So how do you deal with that existing base of vehicles out there? So the answer is, I think all we can do is keep applying pressure. 
and whether it's pressure from regulators saying, look, we're going to regulate if we don't sort your act out, or it's security researchers going, we're going to drag you through the media if you don't get it right. So sadly, there's not a great deal we can do for the existing products, although I would love to see the right to return, because that's a huge incentive, isn't it? If a product you bought is proven insecure, I'd love to see the ability to return it. So how do you deal with like, the disposable IoT for things like agriculture and other areas like that? I mean, there's some, some things which you've just got practically no control over whatsoever. So. Yeah, I, I think at the moment we're stuffed, frankly. I think there's so much um, poor security and so much IoT already that all we can do is drive forward. I think trying to retrospectively apply security is going to be very, very difficult. All we can do is hopefully shine a light on it and encourage people not to use the bad ones. Thank you. Okay. Martin? So you pointed out early on that a large part of this is coming from the chip manufacturers and the software manufacturers, yet at this point you're attacking, and that's maybe not the right term, but your attack surface is the end product. How do we push this back farther in the process and, and actually make the people who are creating the kits, creating the chips, make them make security part of their process from the beginning? So that's a really good question, actually. So many of the big chip vendors, the ARMs, the microchips, the STs of this, of this world, do actually all produce really good secure chipsets you know, with lots of great security functionality, which is fantastic. The problem is, until recently, there's been a bit of a price differential there. So encouraging the manufacturers of the, of the products, so the device manufacturers, they're making them understand why it's worth paying a few more cents for a better chip with all this functionality is a really good place to go. However, I think actually for most IoT product manufacturers, the key is not to try and do it all yourself. Outsource the platform. Outsource the development to people who understand. And at the moment, I think what I tried to show in the talk was that outsourcing to the wrong people is what's causing many of these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Carlo of your National Cyber Security Centre, Finland. Um, just wondering, how, what is your take on the situation of automotive IoT security? I mean, the product life of present-day cars, you, you can easily count that they, we have those cars that are so, so sold out now, they are on the street for 10, 15 years, at least some, and you have to support them, and, and we are getting a number of remote control or remote monitoring uh, hookups there, and all the automated e-call e systems there. How, how, do you find the, how, how do you find the car manufacturers taking the automotive I IoT security situation? Okay, so I spent the week before last in Detroit, um, and actually the manufacturers are taking it very seriously, but they still have the same problem with legacy. So majority of automotive manufacturers have got security pretty much nailed, but they're going through a problem of now trying to retrofit security to their existing product range. And that's a real challenge. That's the hardest bit of it. It's not so much starting from clean sheet and going, let's build a secure vehicle, which Tesla had a pretty good go at. It's not perfect, but it's better than many. How do you then go, well, we've got all these legacy ECUs and issues and connectivity, and then retrofitting it. That's the hard bit. And I get a great example of the challenges, for example, the, the Megamos transponder hack, you might remember, that was kept quiet for two years because it took VW two years to get all the cars in to their service centers to get the software upgraded. That's less of a problem now, now that we have telematics, so you can reply the updates over the air. And I'm sure you've all seen your car pop up in the morning going, I've got new software for you, great. It's going to take 15 minutes to apply. Not so great. <laughs> I want to go to the train station, I'm in a hurry. So there are huge problems, but they are being dealt with. Yeah, but I would, not, would like to get my car to report a service update when, while I'm driving 100 kilometers per hour on the road. Yes, <laughs> that's not so good, such a good place. I agree. It's a huge challenge for the industry, but in fairness, and I say this as a highly critical security researcher, actually the automotive industry are on it, and they are working really hard on it as well. So I think they deserve a little bit of credit, but they do have a huge install-based problem to deal with. Well, they have a higher risk factor, right? That's a higher impact factor on what you're talking. So my, my question is not about cars. It's more of potentially a philosoph uh, the start of a philosophical debate. When you go back to the children devices, um, are, are the generations coming up just starting to look and be more 
attracted and dependent on technology to do things that we should be doing as humans and connecting with our children, say? I mean, aren't we just like adding a layer of abstraction and like pushing off the, as, as users, pushing off the problem? So wouldn't the argument be that we should be teaching people how to, how to um, effectively or, or properly use these devices or properly evaluate why they actually need these devices. So that's a really, really good point. So much consumer IoT. How much of it do we actually need? How much do you need to boil your kettle remotely? I don't know about you, my kettle doesn't take very long to boil. So why do I need to boil it remotely? Why do I need to call it on the train home? It's going to take me 30 seconds when I get there. So I, I'd ask everyone to consider what is the business case, the personal business case for buying these smart things. Do you need a smart toilet? I've seen one. I've tried to buy one to pen test it. But do we need these things? And I think there are some cases where there are real clear business benefits. So for example, allowing the elderly to live assisted by themselves much longer. I think there's some great ideas there. I think in healthcare telematics, there's so much we can learn about the population's healthcare and how we can improve it. And I think there are lots of different benefits, but I think we also need to stop getting too excited about having a smart hot tub. D did we need it? And I think if we are, as a society, going to go, do you know what, yeah, we're going to do smart everything, then I think we need to accept there needs to be a cost of training people to understand how to do security themselves. Because right now, consumers don't have a clue. And I think many IoT manufacturers are exploiting that lack of awareness to sell them cheap, insecure products. Okay, I think there's one up at the back there. Sorry. Uh, so potentially building on that statement, do you think that we'll see product vendors start to reduce the functionality because um, the business case is no longer there once they understand how much it costs to build the security in? So uh, I'm going to turn that question on its head because I actually disagree that it costs a great deal of money to build security in. So when we look at most of the products, they've actually got all the functionality they need in them. It's just there's been a few errors made along the way, with the exception of perhaps the smart hot tub, which had no authorization process at all. Everything else we've looked at has all the functionality. It's just been done badly. So I don't think it would have cost much more to have done that securely. I'd also argue that as we start to see economies of scale, as more and more smart platform providers become used, I think we'll see it easier to get a product to market because there is scale, and when a new device manufacturer comes to market, go, right, I'm going to use that platform. It's easy to implement. It's cheap to implement. I'll be there to market faster than trying to roll my own and, frankly, making a mess of the security. So I actually think that bringing in secure platforms is the way forward. It gets product to market faster, and it means we don't find security getting in the way of innovation. Captain. Can you get another one? Yes, go. <laughs> just, just a quick comment that my, my biggest concern with the IoT market is actually the scale there. As especially with, when you think with Mirai, I mean, the sheer volume that you, of traffic that you can generate through the uh, ins whole installed IoT base, just take a couple of Chinese cameras, uh, do, do that is among us, and I'm, I'm, we are just starting to see where this is going to be heading. And it's starting to be in the, in the uncontrollable level at some point. I, I, do you know what, that's a really, really good point. So um, since Mirai was first built, we've been watching lots of different IoT botnets be built, and I'm sure many of you track them as well. What blows my mind that we've seen no one really use a botnet in the same way that Mirai has been used. We've seen DDoS, but we've seen botnets 10, 100, 100 times the scale of what Mirai was. No one's really used them in anger. And I, that's what I'm surprised about. I don't know why that hasn't happened, because you'd expect it to have been done. There are big botnets out there made of consumer IoT, but no one's really used them in anger, and I don't know why. OK. I'm not sure if that's a positive note to end on. <laughs> Think, things, that sounded to me like things could be worse. But there, there was the platform point, which is, is definitely a positive. So, Ken, thank you so much for getting our conference off to a great start.
Um, I'm so glad I wasn't behind you in the security queue at Heathrow. Um, when, when, we won't talk about that. When, when, when I said I was okay with him flying up this morning before the conference, I'd been busily tracking the play and the fact that he might not get on the plane hadn't actually fe featured in my you know, calculation. But uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, we now have a coffee break. As you leave, take a good look at this auditorium. As you look back, as I am looking now. Because after the break, it will look a bit different. Um, this is a really, really fun conference center. Um, the coffee is, keep going down the escalators. The escalators should now be going the re reverse direction to what they were this morning, all the way down into the basement, and then head that way, and you will find coffee. We start again with three, plen three parallel sessions, which are up here, through the same lobby. And there are, I think, the workshops start one floor down, um, if you want to attend those. Have a great conference. Thank you. <laughs>